The American Revolution for Kids. Please take notes as I read. The original 13 colonies at a glance. The population in 1770 was over 2 million. The biggest city in 1770 was Philadelphia, with a population of about 34,000. Their favorite beverage? Tea. The government was under British rule. Most colonies had a royal governor appointed by the king. Local governing bodies, such as Virginia's House of Burgesses, were based on Britain's parliament. Half of their members were appointed by the king and half elected by colonial landowners. The king regarded the laws they passed to be the subject to his will and to parliament. 1760. Be a king. Be a king, George, demanded King Augusta. She wanted her son to be a powerful ruler. The last two kings of Great Britain, George I and George II, were from German royal families and didn't really care what happened in England or its colonies. They left most of the decisions up to the Prime Minister and Parliament. When George III took the throne, he remembered his mother's words. He intended to be a strong ruler. In some countries, kings were all-powerful, but in Great Britain there were limits on the king's rule. George III found this very frustrating. Over the centuries of England's history, the monarchy had gradually been forced to give up some of its power. The nobles, knights, and burgesses, leading citizens, of England had gained rights and a voice in their government. Eventually, they had an official role in the state and became part of the governing body known as Parliament. He wasn't cruel, but George III did not intend to be pushed around. He was king. That pesky parliament, for instance. He couldn't just do away with it, but he threatened or rewarded its members until they voted his way. And those upstart colonists across the ocean? King George was not about to let them decide for themselves on important issues such as trade and taxes. The colonies existed to benefit the crown. Their trade and markets were supposed to bring wealth and power to Great Britain. Deciding for themselves was exactly what many colonists wanted to do. They worked hard to build towns and settlements in a wild new land. They fought, often without any help from the British, to keep their settlements safe from Indian attacks. They built up industries and trade and added to the wealth of their mother country. Yet, the distant government seemed only to care about how much money it could make off its colonies. Since George III had come to the throne, the colonists felt things had gotten worse. As far back as the 1660s, Parliament had passed laws telling the colonists exactly what and with whom they could trade. The Navigation Acts forbade the colonists to sell certain goods to any country other than England. In another act, Parliament demanded that any goods the colonists bought from other countries had to go through England first, so a special tax could be collected on them. Parliament even put a stop to some kinds of trade among the colonies. England passed these acts so its own merchants and landowners would profit. The colonists seethed with anger. They filled their ships with illegal goods and smuggled them past customs agents, to avoid the trade laws they felt were so unjust. King George III stamped his royal foot. He would bring a stop to this smuggling. He intended to control all the trade going in and out of the colonies. He armed his customs officials in colonial ports such as Boston and New York with writs of assistance. These documents allowed them to enter any buildings at any time to search for illegal sm illegal smuggled goods. The colonists cried unfair. In England, such writs were illegal. There, not even King George could enter a man's home without going through the legal system. The colonists who had left England to settle in North America had been assured that they and their heirs would have all the rights of free English subjects. What had happened to that promise? Some colonists claimed the writs of assistance went against their natural rights. Natural rights were so basic, they said, that they went beyond Parliament's laws or King George's decrees. 
Preachers in pulpits and street corner philosophers quoted the philosopher John Locke, who wrote that it was a law of nature that all people have an equal right to life, liberty, and property. Locke also said that the purpose of government was to protect these rights. The colonists thought that since their government was breaking these ancient, though unwritten, laws, that gave them the right to refuse to obey the writs of assistance. King George said, We do not agree. The King and the Kingdom George III was a tall, gray-eyed, 22-year-old when he was crowned King of England. He inherited the throne from his grandfather, George II. All three Georges were from the royal house of Hanover, a region of Germany. For a time, the kings of England didn't even speak English. During his reign, George III founded the Royal Academy of Arts, collected tens of thousands of books for his royal library, fathered 15 children, and lost the American colonies. George loved gardening and farming. People called him Farmer George, behind his back, of course. And he began to show signs of mental illness. He was declared unfit to rule. His eldest son carried out his duties as king. George III's 60-year reign was the second longest in British history. He was the most recent king in a monarchy that stretched back to the warrior chieftains of the Dark Ages. He shared power with England's parliament. Made up of the king, the House of Commons, and the House of Lords, Parliament made laws for Great Britain and its colonies. In ancient times, the House of Lords was a group of noblemen who counseled the king. Membership in this group became hereditary. The House of Commons first met in the 13th century when knights and burgesses were summoned to meet with the king. In spite of this name, this body did not really speak for the common people. In the 1700s, only nobles and wealthy landowners were represented in Parliament. Several prime ministers, leaders of Parliament appointed by the king, served during George III's reign. King George forced William Pitt, who sided with the colonists, to resign, but later brought him back to power. George Grenville led Parliament to pass the Stamp Act. Lord North held the office for years and completely supported King George and his policies. Patriots or Whigs versus the Loyalists or the Tories Not all colonists felt the same way. While many people protested against the British government, many others, from one-fifth to one-third of the colonists, remained firmly loyal to the king. Those who rebelled and fought against England became known as Patriots or Whigs. These loyal to the crown were called Loyalists or Tories. The word Whig and Tory came from the names of political parties in Great Britain. Even some patriots didn't want to completely break away from British rule. As relations grew tense between the colonies and Great Britain, it caused fierce divisions among neighbors, friends, and family members. John Adams, 1735-1826 Young John Adams hated studying. He told his father, who came up with a solution. If your studies don't suit you, his father said, my meadow yonder needs a ditch. After two days of digging, John was happy to go back to his books. When he grew up, he became a lawyer. During the Stamp Act crisis, he wrote brilliant and inspiring essays about rights and government. Adams served as a delegate to the Continental Congresses, then as a diplomat who settled the peace treaty with Britain. He became vice president under George Washington and the second president of the United States. John Adams, who was a cousin to Samuel Adams, and his wife Abigail had four children. One of them, John Quincy Adams, became the nation's sixth president. Abigail Adams, 
1744 to 1818. At a time when girls were expected to devote their lives to child rearing and chores, Abigail Smith had something else in mind. She spent her childhood reading the books in her father's library. Her lively mind attracted John Adams, and they married. When her husband was selected as a delegate to the Continental Congress, Abigail managed the house and farm while raising and educating their four children. She wrote her husband long letters about her life and ideas. Though it was thought unseemly for a woman to show an interest in politics, Abigail spoke her mind, sometimes signing her letters, Sister Delegate. As her husband worked to shape a new nation, she reminded him that women should have political rights and spoke out against slavery. Her ideas greatly influenced her husband, her dearest friend, who became the second president of the United States. Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790. Ben Franklin began every day with the question, What good shall I do this day? Perhaps that's why he accomplished so much. Franklin was a printer and publisher, inventor, scientist, philosopher, and statesman. He invented bifocals, the lightning rod, a type of odometer, and the Franklin stove. He founded the first American circulating library. He figured out that lightning and electricity were related by flying a kite with a metal key attached to it during a storm. Don't try this yourself. He taught himself four languages. He played the guitar, harp, and violin, and invented a musical instrument called the harmonica. All this and more, yet he'd only gone to school for two years. One of 17 children in a Boston family, Benjamin started working when he was 10. At 17, he went to Philadelphia with three cents in his pocket. He bought three loaves of bread and gave two of them away. After a few years later, after a visit to London, he was an established publisher and businessman. He retired early from that career to pursue his passion for science. Franklin served the colonies as postmaster, as delegate at the Second Continental Congress, and as the colony's representative in France. After the war, he helped create the new United States government at the Constitutional Convention. With his wife, Deborah, he raised three children. His son, William, grew up to be a loyalist and King George's royal governor of New Jersey. George Washington, 1732 to 1799. Forget the wooden teeth and the cherry tree. They're both myths. But George Washington did have false teeth, several sets of ivory and cow's teeth, and telling lies wasn't his style. George's father, a Virginia planter, died when he was a boy. As a teenager, George worked as a surveyor, then inherited his brother's estate, Mount Vernon. At age 19, he was an officer in Virginia's militia. He fought side by side with the British in the French and Indian War, then came home to marry Martha Custis, a widow with two children. His hopes for a quiet life changed when he went to Philadelphia as a Continental Congress delegate and was elected commander of the new army. Washington was tall, six feet four inches, at that time a giant, and fair-skinned. His face was marked with smallpox scars. He was athletic, loved to ride horses and hunt, and had spent years roughing it in the western wilds. 
According to Thomas Jefferson, he was the best dancer in Virginia. He was also shy, serious, generous, and brave, and worked hard to control his hot temper. As a young man, Washington was determined to improve himself through reading and study. He copied down rules of civility and decent behavior and followed them unfailingly. The rules ranged from the sensible to the silly, from respect your elders, listen when others speak, and don't point or roll your eyes, to things such as cleanse not your teeth with the tablecloth, but if others do so, let it be done without a peep to them. His soldiers adored him, and so did the American people. When the war was over, they elected him as their first president. Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826. Tall and bony, red-haired, shy among strangers and lively with friends, Thomas Jefferson was the eldest son of a Virginia planter and surveyor. He liked to swim, play violin, and ride horses. But most of all, he was driven to learn. Jefferson studied 15 hours a day. In the mornings, he studied science, religion, and law. Every afternoon, he read about politics and history. He saved evenings for languages and literature. At the time of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson was 32 years old and one of the youngest delegates. He had been a lawyer and a member of Virginia's House of Burgesses and had married a young widow named Martha. He would later become Minister to France, George Washington's Secretary of State, and the third President of the United States. Jefferson was also an architect, gardener, inventor, musician, naturalist, surveyor, and founder of the University of Virginia. All that studying paid off. July 4th, 1776, the first fourth. Congress tried one last time to make things right with England. Delegate John Dickinson drafted an olive branch petition. The olive branch is an emblem of peace and sent it to King George. The king felt that the colonies were declaring war and trying to make peace at the same time. He wouldn't even read the petition. The next document they sent got his attention. Virginia delegate Richard Henry Lee stood up in Congress one day and proposed that the connection between the colonies and Great Britain be dissolved. Thomas Jefferson was chosen to write the document that declared the colonies free from Great Britain's rule. Jefferson thought Adams should write it. Adams declined. I'm unpopular, he said, and you write ten times better than me. After many late nights in his rented room, Jefferson finished his Declaration of Independence. It outlined grievances against King George and stated that the United Colonies are are and ought to be free and independent states. In words that changed the path of history, Jefferson stated the noble principles that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The role of government was to secure these rights, Jefferson stated. Since Great Britain was not doing so, the American people were claiming their right to break away. With this declaration, the rebellion of the colonies changed from an argument about taxes to a first step toward creating a new kind of government, one based on principles of equality and human rights. On the 4th of July, 1776, the delegates gathered to sign Jefferson's document. John Hancock was the first to put his quill to the parchment. He signed with a flourish, large enough for King George to read without spectacles. Hancock turned to Benjamin Franklin and said, We must be unanimous. There must be no pulling different ways. We must all hang together. 
Franklin knew that signing the document was treason and could mean death for all the signers, but he could never resist making a joke. Yes, he agreed, we must indeed all hang together, or assuredly we shall all hang separately. Carrying copies of the radical document, couriers rode furiously to towns across the land. They posted the declaration on liberty trees and read it aloud on street corners. In Philadelphia, the State House Bell, now called the Liberty Bell, rang loudly. In New York, General Washington read the declaration to his soldiers. John Adams, in a letter to his wife Abigail, predicted that Americans' independence would be celebrated for generations to come with parades and fireworks. That year, Americans across the land celebrated with bells and bonfires. Winter, 1777-1778, to Valley Forge Washington wrote letter after letter to Congress, begging for supplies for his suffering army. In December, he brought his men to Valley Forge, high ground 18 miles northwest of Philadelphia, to wait out the winter. It took a week's march to get there through wind, snow, and sleet. When they arrived, their hardships had just begun. In the best of times, the life of a Continental Army soldier was a difficult one. Long marches, disease, battle wounds, and primitive medical treatment took a dreadful toll. Worst was the constant hunger. The search for something to eat was the business that usually employed us, as one private described it. At times, the only food the soldiers had was what they borrowed from a farmer's fields or hunted up in the woods. Washington complained bitterly about the poor rations and lack of supplies, angrily declaring that his men were made of flesh and not stone. Now his men were wearied from their march and had no food, but they needed shelter from winter's cold. They set to work building rough log and mud huts. Washington refused the comfort of a house until the huts were finished. I will share in the hardship and partake of every inconvenience, he said. It hurt him to see his men, without clothes to cover, their, to co cover themselves, without blankets to lie upon, without shoes. Barefoot sentries stood watch while standing on their hats. Others, without shirts or coats, walked through the camps, huddled in ragged blankets. One night, a dinner party was held in camp, and only those without a pair of trousers were invited to attend. Men suffered from frostbite. Many fell to the diseases that raged through the camps. Smallpox, typhus, typhoid, dysentery, pneumonia. They were weakened by hunger, surviving on fire cakes, flour and water patties baked on hot rocks, and pepper soup made of water and peppercorns. Many became angry and began to speak of revolting against their commanders. The shortages and hardships seemed even more bitter to those who knew that food and supplies were near. Profiteers took advantage of the army's need by charging high prices. Farmers sold goods to the British and were paid in solid pounds, the money of England, rather than to the Continental Army, whose money was not worth the paper it was printed on. During the cold months, soldiers froze while, the, while barrels of shoes, stockings, and clothing sat along the roads without horses or men to carry them to camp. Only miles away in Philadelphia, the British troops were comfortably housed. General Howe turned down the chance to strike at Washington's weakened forces. Instead, he enjoyed fine foods, balls, and the company of Philadelphia's loyalist households. He ha held a reputation as a great soldier from earlier days, but now showed no eagerness for war. Card games and dances kept him up until the wee hours of the night. According to Ben Franklin, Howe had not taken Philadelphia. I beg your pardon, Franklin said. Philadelphia has taken Howe. In the terrible winter at Valley Forge, 2,000 Americans died. Many despaired and deserted, but most remained faithful to their cause and their general. 
When spring came, they left their windowless huts ready to fight again. It was a different army from the one that had stumbled into the camp at Valley Forge. The soldiers had a renewed loyalty to their general, who had suffered with them and cared for them. And, thanks to the work of Baron von Steuben, they were prepared to fight. Von Steuben was one of many foreigners who joined the American fight for independence. He came to General Washington from Germany with a letter from Ben Franklin, who introduced the bearer as the Baron von Steuben, lately a lieutenant general in the King of Prussia's service. In fact, the bearer was neither a baron nor a general, but he turned out to be one of the best things to happen to the Continental Army. Von Steuben volunteered his services and took on the task of training and drilling the soldiers. Under his direction, the untrained fighters became disciplined and effective troops. The short, stocky baron began his day at three o'clock every morning. There was plenty to do. There seemed to be no order or discipline in the American camp. Washington said his men regarded an officer no more than a broomstick. Training was haphazard and infrequent. Men came and went, often taking their muskets with them. Res records were not kept, equipment not cared for, and the soldiers, as the baron quickly learned, had their own ideas. In Europe, the baron wrote a friend, you say to your soldier, do this, and he does it. Here, I am obliged to say, this is the reason you ought to do it. Von Steuben brought out the best in the independent Americans. He didn't speak English, so he memorized orders to fix bayonets, load and fire, move from column into line, and conduct other maneuvers. When angry, he swore furiously in French and German, then turned to his interpreter and asked him to swear in English on his behalf. The Baron held inspections, parades, and reviews. At night he stayed up planning drills for the next day and writing a detailed military manual. For his hard work, he was rewarded with the rank of Major General in the American Army. Baron von Steuben was one of many foreign soldiers who sailed the Atlantic to fight for the Patriot cause. Some came for glory and military rank, but others were inspired by America's dream of independence. By spring, thanks to Nathaniel Green, the tireless new quartermaster, the officer in charge of equipment, the men had food, clothes, and supplies. The army also had a new ally, France. Britain and France were longtime enemies. The French had been secretly sending military supplies to the Americans for some time, but held back on declaring war. Ben Franklin, sent to the French court by the Continental Congress, helped to win France's support. He completely charmed the French people with his wit, his good nature, and his rustic fur hat. The surrender at Saratoga was the victory needed for France to officially join forces with the new United States. Later, Spain and other European countries would declare war against the British too. King Louis furnished money, arms, soldiers, and sailors to the cause. To celebrate the French alliance, a grand parade was held, with Baron von Steuben organizing special drills and ceremonies. All cheered as cannon boomed and muskets fired fire of joy, a running fire up and down the ranks. After a winter of suffering, the Continentals were heartened, drilled, and ready to fight. September 23, 1780, Treason of the Blackest Die Benedict Arnold was in love. While acting as military commander of Philadelphia, he had met and later married Peggy Shippen. Peggy was a young, beautiful, charming woman and a Tory. Other American officers were suspicious of Arnold's relationship with the loyalist Peggy and unhappy about his questionable money-making schemes. Arnold lived in the finest house in town and threw extravagant parties for loyalist guests. 
he was charged with misconduct and found guilty of minor offenses. Washington, who thought Arnold a good officer, gave him the gentlest of reprimands. Washington's trust was misplaced. For months, Arnold had been slipping coded messages to British General Clinton. In exchange for money and a title, Arnold offered his services to the Crown. He sold, told secrets about troop movements and plotted to hand the strategic fortress of West Point with its 3,000 soldiers over to the British. Arnold pleaded with Washington for the command of West Point. Washington granted his request. As soon as he took over command, Arnold set about weakening West Point's defenses. He drew detailed plans of its entrances and gun placements and sent them to Clinton's assistant, Major John Andre. As the scheduled British takeover approached, Andre and Arnold arranged a midnight meeting to go over the scheme. Their plan set, Andre rode away with secret documents hidden in his boot. He carried a pass signed by Arnold, giving permission for its bearer, John Anderson, to travel. Washington happened to be nearby. He sent word to Arnold that he was coming to inspect West Point's fortifications. As Arnold sat down to breakfast that morning, he received another message saying that a spy named John Anderson had been captured. Arnold's secret papers betraying the cause were on their way to General Washington. Knowing that the penalty for treason was death, Arnold said a hurried goodbye to his wife and newborn son. He rode downriver to a British ship and sailed off to safety. Arnold's treachery shocked the nation. Patriots everywhere hanged and burned his likeness. Major Andre was tried and hanged for the crime of spying. Arnold, who had been one of America's finest officers, now fought for the British. He even led troops against his own hometown and burned it to the ground. Nathaniel Green, 1742-1786 to With no military experience or formal training, Nathaniel Green became one of the greatest patriot generals. While working as a blacksmith and miller, Green taught himself history, mathematics, and in spite of his pacifist Quaker upbringing, military science. Green started as a private in a Rhode Island militia company. One general said that within a year he was equal in military knowledge to any and very superior to most. As quartermaster general, Green saw that the men at Valley Forge were fed. As southern commander, Green's creative strategies surprised and confounded his enemies. September 3, 1783, Treaty of Paris Ben Franklin was overjoyed when the fighting came to an end. There is no such thing as a good war or bad peace, he exclaimed. It took some time, though, before the war officially ended. British armies still occupied New York, Charleston, and Savannah. In Europe, Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay negotiated a peace settlement between the warring countries. Washington kept his army near the Hudson River in case things went wrong. A year and a half later, eight years to the day since the first shots at Lexington, the troops learned that a peace treaty had been reached. The Treaty of Paris set the boundaries of the United States from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, from the Great Lakes to Florida, which was held by Spain. It also required the states to return property to loyalists who did not fight in the war. The war had taken a terrible toll. More than 25,000 Continental Army soldiers died. There are no accurate estimates for the militia. Afterward, 70,000 loyalists moved to Canada, returned to England, or started their lives over in the West Indies. Around 5,000 Hessians stayed to make new homes in the United States. <laughs>